Housemans is so proud to be hosting the launch of the American Way Stories of Invasion, which is a collection published by Comma Press as part of its absolutely brilliant history into fiction series, edited by Rob Page and Ursula Casagrande. Um, I have to say, personally, I'm a huge fan of this series, um, other books that I have read for, for all of us who love fiction and are interested in the world, the combination of beautiful fiction writing and insightful analysis. I don't think there's anything else like it out there. Uh, no surprise that it's coming from an independent publisher uh, that richly deserves all the praise it gets. Now home to two Nobel Prize winners, most recently, Abdul Razak Gurma. Um, so tonight's book that we'll be talking about, The American Way, I think it's obvious from the title already what the subject will be. Invasions, CIA-sponsored coups, election interference, stay-behind networks, rendition, weapons testing, the increasingly privatized forever wars and their unending flow of revenue to the military-industrial complex. In the 75 years since the end of the Second World War, this is what Pax Americana looks like. We all know that in broad strokes. Um, and as this book's introduction, which was written just as the US was withdrawing from Afghanistan, most recently, um, mentions. But what about close up? Um, when you get beyond the hand waving and saying, yes, that's exactly what we uh, expect of our uh, American friends. The aim of this book is to look at US foreign policy via stories that focus on the human cost close up of these interventions by writers who are from those places. That, um, the book covers everything from Canada, my native land, to Guatemala and Chile, from Gaza and Iran to Congo and South Africa. In many of these cases, and I think in the two stories we'll discuss this evening, the phrase, beware Americans bearing human rights is particularly salient. And that's a phrase that comes up in the book's introduction. So joining us this evening, I am just beyond honored to say what eminent contributors to this volume we have joining us this evening, Fariba Nawa and Bina Shah, two acclaimed writers, thinkers uh, across a number of fields from fiction uh, to nonfiction. They've both kindly agreed to stay up rather late um, from uh, where they are located. And uh, if possible, uh, hopefully we'll hear some excerpts from their stories and uh, we can talk about their own perspectives on the political, economic, and human cost of American hegemony. Uh, just a few words about these authors, and again, I could take up, you know, a good hour just telling you why it's such an honor to have them here, um, but I'll keep it brief. Fariba Nawa is an Afghan-American freelance journalist based in Istanbul. She was born and raised in Afghanistan until she was nine and then fled the Soviet invasion with her family to America in the 1980s. She's the author of Afghanistan Inc., uh, which is a very often cited resource in international debates on the effectiveness of reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan. So when we say she wrote the book on it, she literally did. She's also author of Opium Nation from 2011. Many of you will be familiar with that book. It's a personal account of the drug trade in Afghanistan and its impact on women in particular. She's also the host and chief editor of the podcast On Spec. And astonishingly, um, the story uh, that we are discussing this evening in this collection is her first piece of published fiction, which I think unless I had seen that in the bio, I would not have guessed. Also joining us, Bina Shah, um, no introduction needed again, but I'll give you one anyway. A Karachi based author of five novels and two collections of short stories. Her latest novel, Before She Sleeps, was published in 2018, attracted plaudits from, from peers on the order of Margaret Atwood. She's a contributor to the New York Times, Al Jazeera, The Huffington Post, Granta, The Independent, and The Guardian, and a frequent guest on the BBC. And she writes a regular column for Dawn, which is Pakistan's biggest English language newspaper. She works on issues of women's rights and female empowerment in Pakistan and across Muslim countries. And last year, she was awarded the rank of Chevalier in the Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French Ministry of Culture. And I'm hoping that tonight she'll read a bit from her story, A Bird with One Wing. 
My name is Karen Shook, and I'm honored to introduce this event for Houseman's, a proudly independent bookshop whose doors first opened in 1945. We specialize in books, magazines, and periodicals of radical interest and progressive politics, focusing on subjects such as feminism, black politics and identity, LGBTQIA perspectives, the environment, socialism, and anarchism. Our doors opened in April after a year in lockdown, but our mail order business that grew um, like topsy really uh, during lockdown is still in operation. So if you can't visit us in person, we invite you to order your copy of The American Way at www.hausmans.com. And this evening is part of Hausmans' ongoing program of events. And I'd just quickly like to recommend our online event tomorrow, 27th of October, which is Green Social Housing, a virtual panel on housing and sustainability. And on Wednesday, the 10th of November, also at seven, we'll be spotlighting the book Veteranhood, Rage and Hope in British Ex-Military Life with author Joe Glenton in conversation with Matt Kennard. You can find out about all of those events at housemans.com and note that we have free access tickets for those who are students, low income and unwaged. So our event tonight will run for about an hour, although I've taken a little chunk out of it already. If you have a question you would like to ask either Fariba or Bina, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. That's the Q&A box, not the chat box. And we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me turn first to Bina. Bina, could I persuade you to um, perhaps read a short excerpt from, um, from your story in this collection? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the story is called A Bird With One Wing. Do you want me to give a little bit of an introduction to the story itself so that our audience members who may not have read it might know what's happening? That would be wonderful. If you would like to do so, that would be great. Thank you. So my short story is um, set in North Waziristan, which is in the tribal area right between Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's now those areas have become legally officially part of Pakistan. But at the time, the short story is set somewhere in the war on terror, somewhere where the drone attacks that were authorized by the CIA were happening with regularity. Um, North Waziristan was a very no man's land, these places were known as. And so this story is actually looking at the, at a drone attack on a bus that is carrying a, a party of a, a village to a wedding in another village. And the story is told from the point of view of a young woman, a young mother called Zaruna. So I will read you a couple of paragraphs from this short story. I can find it, I've got too many windows open. A bird with one wing. When the wedding was over, Zaruna climbed aboard the bus, leaving the evening's cool breeze for the pungent stuffy air of the women's section. All in all, there were about 40 of them, men, women, and children, returning home from the celebrations in a neighboring village. The women sat at the front, swathed in burkas, hiding wedding finery underneath. Their faces made up in carefully hoarded foundation, bright red lipstick, eyes rimmed with gajal. Earrings and necklaces clinked as they laughed and talked and gossiped, while children lay bundled up around them, tired and sleepy in the dark. Further back, their husbands sat together in the men's section, rubbing stomachs full from the six rice dishes served at the feast. It had been Zaruna's cousin's daughter's wedding. The other women had teased her cousin, asking if she was ready to become a grandmother. She was only 35. May you be the grandmother of seven grandsons, they called out to her raucously, making her laugh and the bride cover her face in embarrassment, clearly smiling through her henna'd fingers. Everyone knew you needed sons for inheritance, for land and for feuding, that is to say, for war. Each house had its own graveyard at the front of which the bodies of recent casualties were buried, each grave marked only by a small, modest stone. The more stones, the more honor for the family. As she reached the top of the steps, Zaruna wondered to her husband which seat was a better bet in case of a crash. Her husband conveyed this question to the bus driver who said a crash would be very inconvenient for his schedule, and both men laughed while Zaruna chewed on the end of her burqa, embarrassed. 
The bus driver was her father's cousin's son, a boy she'd known since she was small. He exchanged a few pleasantries with her husband, a little friendly greeting, may you not get tired, and the response, may you never know poverty, falling easily from their lips, with smiles and inquiries about aged parents and young children. It was improper to address a, another man's wife directly, even if she was standing in front of you, so her cousin did not speak to her, showing her husband the respect he deserved. But he gestured silently behind him to a pair of seats in a better condition than the rest. As she sat down, her husband moved on to the back, entrusting her to her cousin's silent care. The young man had already pushed the rear view mirror up to face the ceiling so that his glance would not fall on any woman's face. The woman next to her, Shudla, smiled and offered her a piece of mitai from the wedding feast. Sit next to the window, Shudla said. I know you get carsick. She got up and offered Zerguna the window seat. Zerguna accepted both the seat and the suite, popping the coconut barfi into her mouth and chewing it slowly so that it lasted a long time. It was only a two hour drive from the neighboring village to their hamlet in a small enclave of North Waziristan, not far from Shewa. There had been some discussion about which route to take, whether the old winding single lane mountain road or the Shewa Miransha paved road would get them to the wedding faster. The mountain road was treacherous, the scene of many accidents, but the paved road had more checkpoints and nobody wanted to shepherd their women on and off the bus to be glared at by the Pakistani soldiers. The decision was made to take the back road. They would take the same road now on the return journey at three in the morning and would be home hopefully before dawn. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Bina. I, um, I wonder, Farida, if you would like to read an excerpt from your story. And um, again, um, as Bina did, perhaps give a little introduction to those who haven't read it yet. And then I have lots of questions I would love to ask you both. But in the meantime, I'd love to hear you read this. Sure. Um, when Ra Page reached out to me, I was quite surprised because I don't write fiction. So this was, again, my first work of fiction. And it was a bit difficult because I don't know how to make up stories. So I had to step, step away. It took a lot of untraining to step away from the nonfiction, but um, uh, there, were, there were thousands of us so-called repatriates who went back after September 11th and uh, from all over because we were the largest refugee community in the world up until Syria became one, six million refugees after the Soviet invasion. And so I was, you know, I was one of them. Um, and we went back to Afghanistan to try to do something good, try to rebuild. We thought this was an opportunity for us. Um, and we didn't think it would, the war would last that long. In the beginning, it looked like things were going well. Um, and so it's a story about two people who went back. It's kind of a love story, I suppose. And what happens um, when, both, you know, all of us would go back and we were working in these organizations that were trying to um, do so-called nation building and uh, living through the war, the bombs and the, the various things. And a lot of us had already lived through the Soviet invasion. So this was going to be the second, the American. And they, the, the language changed. It was called the American intervention at first, and then it became invasion uh, 10 years later. So it's set in that environment in Kabul. And uh, let me see what I can. I just got the book, so I haven't even looked at the print version yet because I just opened it. Um, I'm thinking of what's a good spot. Maybe the beginning. I think the beginning, yeah. I can barely see this, okay. I'm naked under the sheets when the housekeeper walks in, causing me to jolt up and cover my breasts. Hang on, it's very small and I'm very blind. Baray, I yell, get out. Mazerat, she mumbles apologetically, shutting the door behind her. But I imagine her whispering something else. Sakshoi, probably. Dog washer, coming from America calling herself a repatriate, landing a job as a consultant that pays 200 times what she earns as a housekeeper, and all that in the name of rebuilding Afghanistan. Dog washer, 
dishonoring the very word Afghan by sleeping with a man she'd never even married, she wasn't even married to. They come here to save us. She's probably thinking, instead, they shame us. The first time I heard this curse, I was pacing around the Ministry of Education, waiting for a friend to meet me. As I walked, a middle-aged man with yellow crooked teeth on a bicycle began to circle me, looking me up and down from my polarized sunglasses and floral headscarf combo to my Nike Air sneakers. Oh, Sag Shoy, is that what you were doing before coming to America? You think before coming to Afghanistan? You think you're better than us, but you were just a dog washer in America. And you get to be queen here. Take off those glasses so I can look at you. He's sorry, I'm not saying he sneered and spat on the ground, then rode away. And I'll stop there. Um, that just kind of sets the scene for for how people were seen for repatriates coming back to help um, with the locals who lived there and some of the tensions that that existed and grew over time. Arriva, your story, you know, focuses in particular on on people with with dual um, dual identities, um, an Afghan who has lived in America and has returned and and um, uh, in this um, ambiguous or um, setting. Uh, Bina, um, and 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 there's a, there's a there's a real focus in this story on um, what it is to be a woman in two societies that are that are hostile to women, Afghanistan and the America that um, that her boyfriend um, Sikander, you know, uh, has gr has has grown up in, and and yet we see that uh, Raha, the protagonist, is. Um, is getting it from both sides in, in terms of what's expected of her as a woman and, and, and how she's viewed. Bina, I, I, your story as well um, focuses on the issues of, of women's autonomy or, or lack thereof. Both of you have that, have that dual perspective. Um, and I wonder, um, since, um, since so much of what is said about American power is, is, you know, as we hear about Afghanistan, oh, we're suddenly very concerned about young women's rights. Do both of you see this, this concern for, for women's rights in, in the American view of the world as in any way sincere? Uh, are you about, go ahead, answer that. I'll formulate my answer. Sure. I, I think it's complicated. I, I don't think we can say yes or no to that because there are a lot of people who, who do care um, and who have tried to help. And there's been a lot of, I mean, this past generation that came into being in the last 20 years uh, in Kabul and the city specifically have done really well for themselves, um, have gotten all kinds of degrees and skills and confidence. And I've been witness to this. So um, and, and it's with American allies and American funding. So to say that there's no sincerity would be would be inaccurate. But I think on the in the political spectrum, women were obviously used as tools to further this this war, um, and it was disingenuous. So it depends on on who you're talking about, what sector sector society. And right now we're, you know, in the news, you hear a lot about the Kabul elite and how awful they were and how they corrupt they were. It was specific politicians. There were a lot of people working really hard to make a difference. And they're kind of being overlooked right now because you're getting two very polar. Oh. For 5% of Pakistan right now, there was some poll done like support the Taliban, despite all of this, um, the, the women's, uh, you know, what was happening with the women. And then, and then you're getting the other side, which is, oh, the Taliban are awful, and we have to go in, and we have to save the women, and we have to evacuate the women. So it's, the, the nuances are kind of being, you know, lost again, uh, especially in the media perspectives that are coming out. And so again, it's complicated. If you ha ask the Hazara community who are being, you know, massacred right now uh, because they're Shia, they look different. 
they're a minority, they're going to tell you the best thing that ever happened to them was America coming in. They, 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 you know, they grew wings in the last 20 years. They did not have these opportunities before. But if you ask Pashtun men um, who were living in the Southwest or in the South of Afghanistan or in the East where the, you know, the night raids were going on, it's a very different perspective. Thanks. And Bina, I know you've written, you've written about, for example, in the UK, where groups of Pakistani British men uh, are described as grooming gangs. You've yeah, and and there have been many uh, political commentators on the right uh, uh, who have sought to to uh, pursue a racist agenda by explaining this um, situation in, in in terms of religion and race. And you've pointed out, obviously, that these Victorian values. Uh, that are being ascribed to certain communities are by no means uh, unique to them. Uh, what about what about the people in the global north who say, well, you know, we've got to come and help Pakistan because women are terribly oppressed. I mean, the Sarguna in your story is not uh, her her situation is a difficult one even before we talk about drones. Yeah. Um, so I think that going back to your first question, which Fariba answered very eloquently, <clears throat> I'll just add that I think that the sentiment is, is a sincere one, but it's so informed by ignorance. It is so wild assumptions and stereotypes about what these brown men are like and how these brown women need to be saved from these brown men and you know the the so-called white saviors. I, I don't like the term myself, but I will use it just because it is in, in popular parlance. But uh, the white saviors are coming in with the automatic assumption that this is a group that needs saving, without actually thinking, do we need to save them or do they need to save themselves? And the work that I do, uh, the, the, the writing and the sort of the, the advocacy for women is always that they should be the ones to stand up for themselves. And at the most, they need to get the help from their governments and from their political allies, first within the country for reform and for change, for radical reform as, as the need may be, or for legislative reform, so on and so forth. The outside help it's limited. What, what can you really do if you are a woman sitting in Minnesota and you want to help a woman in, in Waziristan or in Karachi or in Kabul or anywhere, Kandahar? What are you really going to do? I tell women who have been asking me since the beginning, since the US withdrew from Afghanistan, what can we do? What can we do? I say the best thing you can do, and I'm not meaning to speak for Afghan women at all, Donate money to the, the groups that are helping the Afghan refugees, the people who have now left Afghanistan and are coming to your countries, help them, support them, help them integrate into your communities, support them financially, get them on their feet. That's the best thing you can do because you're staying local, but you are helping the women that you feel have been harmed by these events. It's very delicate, it's very tricky. You know, we get you get accusations of then neo-colonialism and neo-imperialism, and as we know, the the invasion of Afghanistan was very much based on this idea that women needed to be saved from the Taliban. They need to be rescued from the Taliban, so that justifies this misadventure, which has had mixed results. As uh, Fariba said, been a boon for the Hazaras, been been a, a terror for people like Zarguna in my story, whose entire family is affected by these, these drone strikes. So it, it is so complicated, it is so nuanced, but I don't think we ever want to say, we're gonna save you. No, how can we help you save yourselves? How can we support you, get the word out, make your story, amplify your voices, make your stories known? That would be my approach. Fariba, that question uh, coming from women in the global north about what can we do uh, must be one that, that, that you have heard as well as an Afghan-American woman. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, donating to these organizations that I can actually do something is useful. I also think that skills sharing, for example, right now, there's a huge need for 
mental health support. So if there are psychologists and therapists who can team up with translators, because the kinds of messages I'm getting from Afghanistan from very, very strong women who can handle anything are suicide notes. And I'm trying to get people out. I've already caught nine people out, but it's been really difficult. And there's been an entire debate about, should we get these people out? And I do think so. I think the situation in Afghanistan, the way it is right now, and the way that the Taliban are moving forward, uh, Again, it was a ruse. This whole peace process was a joke to people like us who knew what was going to happen because we, we know how these folks think. They're not changing. They're not going to change. Um, you can negotiate with them until, you know, and uh, until they, 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 I don't see any move forward. Um, people are starving to death in Kabul. Just yesterday, eight kids in Kabul from a Hazara family starved to death because there are it's a mess. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mess what's happened. And there's a sense of betrayal from all sides, especially where, when the women, where the women are concerned that they have been like, they, you know, we were thrown under the bus. And when I say we, I mean, I have family there. I have cousins there. Uh, I have friends there. It's been a very traumatizing, emotional time. And I called this like two months before it happened. And a lot of my friends on Facebook upset with me because I said it's it's over you guys need to get out and there was still this they were holding out and then when it happened and it happened so fast they thought I had some special insider information I didn't I just saw it coming because of all the you know all these years of being a part of this um situation even though I haven't gone back I haven't gone back since my book Opium Nation came out because of security concerns so uh, I think that they can, this kind of like online help, online, um, every, so people do have internet and they are in their, hold up in their homes for those who can afford it, who have the, uh, some, a lot of people now in Afghanistan speak English. In fact, because of the tensions between Pashto and Farsi, uh, Kabul has now become sort of an English speaking city. And I think people in the West who do speak English can help that way. Get online, teach girls because they're not going to school, you know? Um, teach, t get mental health uh, help, get any kind of skills that they can get. Uh, that's, that's what I've needed. For me, my priority is get, pe get people out. And it's a real big challenge right now. I wanted to ask you both a little bit about the process of contributing to, um, to this, um, this collection. Obviously, um, I think one of the great strengths of it is that it pairs um, fiction with um, expositional articles. Um, in, in the case of Bina's story, uh, Ian Shaw has written an afterward, and in the case of Fariba's, Neil Faulkner. Um, uh, Bina, obviously fiction is not new um, to you. Um, uh, I was wondering if this was a story you had already written and, and it fit in with it, or if, if it was uh, commissioned for this piece. Right. Um, so I just want to briefly, sorry, go back to something Fariba said about the mental health. I, I was on Twitter and uh, an Afghan person tweeted that the people are so depressed. There's so, there's so much anxiety. Can you help? Can anyone help us? And I actually went to an NHS website where there were information sheets on depression, anxiety, and so on and forth in Pashto and Dari. And I said, look, there's this information there. Get it out to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even something like that what can I do sitting in Pakistan? But I tried, um, and I'm definitely not one of those people that support the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. I just want to make that very, very clear. Thank I know you. Thank you. It's been very frustrating with trolls no, no, no. online. No, no, no. It's, it's, for me, it's horrific. And I have written a short story back in 1996 about the way women were being treated by the Taliban. And I said, this will happen in Pakistan too. That was the point it's of It's a that. blowback, it's a blowback. And I don't think a lot of Pakistanis realize that. Yeah, no, it's been very frustrating. That, that's a subject for a whole other topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, just so you know, I'm not sure, there's a lot of Afghan Pakistani tension right now. And you know, it's, it's important to, yeah. I want to express my solidarity because I'm heartbroken at what has happened. I was, I was just very, very, anyway. So. Going back to your question about uh, the, uh, the story itself, uh, no, I had not written this short story in the form that you will see it in the book. 
But what I did have was from a, a, a few years ago, maybe four years ago, I wrote the very, very bare bones of a, a vignette about a woman who is in a plane crash. And so when Ra got in touch with me and said, could you write something about the drone attacks in Pakistan? At first I was like, what do I know about this? And as far as I know, um, there is no fiction that deals with the drone attacks of this time period. There's, there's nothing that I'm aware of that was written about this. Uh, the people who have suffered these attacks, I don't think are in the position to be writing fiction about it at this point in time. So I thought and thought and I thought, oh, well, I have this piece. What if I adapt it to what Ra is asking me to do? And so that's how this story evolved into the story of Zervona on the bus. Um, but I had read several years before a book by Professor Afra Ahmed, who um, is an eminent, eminent scholar, uh, used to be the Pakistani High Commissioner to the United uh, Kingdom. And before that, an anthropologist with much experience in the tribal areas. He wrote a very important book called The Thistle and the Drone, which looked at these tribal cultures and how they were being affected by drone attacks. I had read that book and reviewed it when it first came out. So I realized that, well, I do remember something about this. And he, I wrote the story and I actually sent it to him for feedback. And I said, what do you think? Is it accurate? Does it capture? He gave me very val invaluable feedback, especially about what it is actually viscerally like to be in a drone attack, which is something that I cannot have. I, I can't have access to that, firsthand access to that knowledge. So the story was like, it just kept getting more and more refined the more I worked on it from the story of a woman who survives a plane crash to the story of a woman who, I might as well say it, survives a drone attack. Uh, so that is the origin story of the story. Um, now, Fariba, you are um, um, typically associated with the nonfiction expert on the other side, that a fiction writer might come to you for, um, uh, for insights on many of the things you have written such important works on. Um, what happened? Did Ra call you up and say, fancy being a fiction writer? <laughs> yeah, I was really, I was, who are you? And how did you hear about me? And why me? And he goes, well, we wanted someone from, from this background to write it. And I thought about it and I was just like, can I do this? Because honestly, I'm, again, it's, it's one of those things where I've tried, you know, I went from being a digital, from a magazine writer to becoming a radio reporter to, because in this, digital age, you have to wear a lot of hats, especially I'm a freelancer and I've been a freelancer for 22, 23 years. I just don't like working for other people. So, um, and so I thought, okay, we'll take on the challenge of doing something completely different, but it's very intimidating because again, I kept going back and saying, well, this is too real. This is too real. <laughs> I have to change this. And in fact, we had to change names of companies that I had written about in real life, but I wanted to bring that narrative in there and how would I do that? And, uh, and so Ra helped a lot, he did, in terms of sort of advising and even with writing. Um, I don't have to attribute things, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was liberating in a way, I'd like to do more of it. I'm not sure I'm good at it, but it, it's, it, it's an honor to be among these writers and to, I'm gonna read the book because I just got it and try to, um, sort of, and I really like the idea of this sort of history in fiction and, um, the, the academic who wrote my, who wrote the sort of the, the piece, the, the nonfiction part of the fiction I wrote, I thought was quite well done. And, uh, so I, I read his, I read, um, Kama Press's other fiction histories and that's when I decided to do it. I was like, okay, this is a very reputable uh, press and I'd like to be a part of it. Yeah. Do you think it's possible that you can uh, obviously great um, uh, feature writing, magazine journalism, and both of you, uh, both of you have chops in in that area, can achieve what we hope fiction can, which is to bring distant stories or things outside your own experience up close. You know, the great drop intro that puts you right in the middle of the story. Um, Fariba, do do you? But do you think there's anything extra, and maybe Bina can weigh in here, that fiction can do that even the best vivid piece of reportage can't? I think it reaches a bigger audience. Definitely reaches it. It's like movies. 
um, people just read fiction more. They enjoy it more. Um, and even if it's as sad as, uh, as you know, I, I, I keep hearing from friends, we, we just shut, shut out the news. Um, it's too depressing. And I noticed that fiction can be equally depressing. My kids are reading only dystopian novels in school. I've had to tell them to, you know, assign some upbeat stuff to them. But again, it has a different impact, I notice. Um, that, that just sort of fantasy element to it, that imaginary element to it, allows people to um, take in the trauma in a different way. I don't know. I'd be curious to see what, uh, what Bina says about that. So what I think... Uh... People think of fiction and journalism as the binary, right? You, it's either fiction or it's nonfiction. And I think what we, we really see with so much fine writing, it's more of a spectrum where there can be straightforward reporting, the facts, just the facts, ma'am, and there can be straightforward fiction where it's completely made up. And then there's reportage, and then there's sort of auto fiction, and there's the autobiographical fiction. So you're slowly, slowly moving across the spectrum all the way to fiction. Now, for me, I don't think of myself as a journalist. I think of myself as a writer. But I often deal with the same subjects, both in nonfiction and fiction. The difference for me, and my heart is always going to be with fiction. And the difference for me is that fiction to me is artistic. I deal with the same subjects in journalism or in report reportage. I wouldn't say I'm a reporter, but I do it so in fiction in, in a much more artistic way. And there's a lot more space for beauty. There's a lot more space for intertextuality. There's a lot more space for references. My short story, for example, in, in the book has references to the Quran. It has references to astronomy, which is also very important in the Islamic uh, tradition and religion. And it it references many different things, none of which I can remember at this point, because there, you know, there's some distance between me and the story. The other thing that I wanted to do with this story, which I felt more of the freedom in fiction than I perhaps would have in journalism, whenever I read reporting about drone strikes, it was always from a male perspective. And the victims were always male, and they were either young men, or they were suspected terrorists, or they were children on a soccer field, but you never heard from the women. And so it was a very conscious decision for me to say, I want to write this from a woman's point of view. And how do the drone attacks affect women? You know, of course, the men are the obvious victims, but what about the women who are the family members of these victims or themselves killed in these drone attacks, but you never hear of them because in these cultures, women's names are not even taken. You don't, you know, in Afghanistan, I know this, that women's First names are not even supposed to be mentioned. You're not even supposed to know the, the name of a man's wife. In, in Pakistan, there are so many women who are born and they're not even recorded. They don't even have documents. They're not even literate. So what about these women? And so with fiction, not only can I deal with this terrible event in an artistic way and turn something terrible into something beautiful, but I can also then represent half of humanity. I can paint a picture. So that we're not just seeing one half, the men only, we're seeing also the women. So I think for me, that is where the imaginative and creative uh, strengths of fiction, just they work so well in what you're trying to do as a writer. I would say I was really struck by, by the incredible passages of beauty in, in, in what is obviously a story of innocent people being, being murdered by someone pushing a button. Um, uh, do you ever feel a conflict at creating something beautiful that that is that is telling a story that should make us all angry? Can you give me an example of what you found beautiful, and I'll tell you why I included it or what I was doing with it? Um, I suppose when um, uh, uh, when Zarkuna is talking about her son who is born with mild um, Down syndrome, and in fact there's there's a quite transcendental passage at the, at the end of the story. Um. She survives, I think, not just by chance. She didn't just survive by chance because when the drone hits the bus, so now nobody's going to read the story because I'm just going to, but when the drone hits the bus, she is, the, she is a survivor. She doesn't get killed in the attack, but then she has a choice. Does she actually stay where she is and risk another explosion or does she try to get herself out of 
out of that immediate scenario of, of, of death and destruction. And her choice to what, what she chooses to do is very much based on the love she has for her child. And, you know, you're looking, you're dealing with death. I was writing about immediate and terrible death, but what is the opposite of immediate and terrible death? It is life. It is birth. It is rebirth. So when Zerlina gets out of that situation, it's almost as if she is being reborn. She's almost giving birth to herself. And I wanted to parallel that with the very difficult birth of her son and the, the situation with his having the Down syndrome and so on and so forth. So all these layers I build up, and that's also one of the wonderful things you can do with fiction. You can layer things, you can, you can create echoes, resonance, harmonies. You can do things that remind the reader of something they read a little bit earlier. You can do all sorts of things with all the five senses. And if that's not beauty, then I don't know what else is. Thank you. Fariba, I wanted to talk to you about the, about the women in your story, um, both Raha and, and her mother, um, who we hear of, and uh, the fact that, that this story about um, uh, American or Afghan-American, you know, uh, American foreign organizations coming in, consultancy, mercenaries under perhaps um, a cover of, of uh, respectable business, um, that's often a story that we hear from the perspective of the men who were involved. Some of some of Raha's boyfriends, uh, colleagues, you know, the the ex army person or the Scandinavian guy. Um, was was that conscious as well that you wanted to focus not on the usual people? Yeah, I mean, the, the, what Vino is talking about. I mean, I could never talk about sex in a story very rarely in a nonfiction story because that's just taboo. You don't talk about those things. It'd be very hard to get. Uh, women, Afghan women, even anonymously to talk about those things. And if you do, there are consequences to revealing that and you don't want to hurt people. I just spent two weeks uh, in Central Asia where I'd never been in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, doing story on stories on women and everything, everything had to be anonymous because over there, the government comes after you. I'm even uh, me and my colleague were working undercover for the last two weeks. So we had some adventures in Tajikistan. Um, I didn't think I was going to make it back to Istanbul, uh, but we did. So, so my job can, you know, requ requires considerable risk, but what I've learned over the years that uh, the story is not worth hurting people. And so I'm extremely careful uh, on how I identify. And the beauty of fiction is that I could just talk about these things. I mean, what was happening in Kabul, I'd never seen. Okay, but in Baghdad, I saw it, but not to the same level as Kabul. People were leaving their husbands. Journalists were coming in and having affairs. There's an urgency when you go to a war zone that you're not going to wake up the next day. You've come here voluntarily, and part of it is that you just might die, and you've accept accepted that. So people will do all kinds of counterintuitive things, like leave a 20-year marriage, um, or, or, or destroy it by having an affair or, or become an alcoholic. I mean, I saw some really crazy things in Afghanistan of, of extremes. It was just sort of extremes with, with the locals getting to know the foreigners and then the foreigners kind of becoming Afghan in some ways. So it, it just, there's so much. And I started writing a novel uh, in Kabul in 2005 called Love and Betrayal in Kabul based on all the stuff that I was seeing, right? And then I said, okay, I, I, I was too busy trying to cover the news and I just kind of shut it. And one of the other reasons I didn't write it is because it was too real again. I needed some distance from it. Um, and so when Ra called, I knew exactly which story I would write. And it was of this one. So being able to write that story and being able to write about the women who are coming back, um, I mean, as an ex, as a repatriate is what we called ourselves. We had access in a way that no foreign man could come in and have. We spoke the language. I could go to the women's homes. I could go to the villages. As an American, I, I had the backup of sort of authorities. I have never had the kind of journalistic access that I had in Afghanistan anywhere else. Pakistan, I was kicked out of in 2001, haven't been able to return. Every time I've applied for visa, it was rejected. I was deported. Uh, Iran, similar story. And, and so even in Turkey, you know that it's dicey here. But Afghanistan, we could write anything at that point. 
uh, as a journalist. And then some, except for these, these sort of social issues. Um, and so I'm happy that I was able to, and I'd like to do more of that, uh, talk about these sort of familial relationships. I thought a lot about the fact that um, in this story, again, uh, I don't know to what extent it's okay to give spoilers uh, for a short story, but but Raha, uh, whose who's repatriate boyfriend, opts to uh, opts to uh, maybe serve himself in a way by returning to a more traditional um, uh, relationship, and in the end, Raha's mother, uh, who chooses to believe that you know her 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 daughter won't have been sleeping with her boyfriend, but at the end, Raha says, mum, you know, just find me, you know, get me an arranged marriage. Yeah, so it, they it, both kind of go back to the traditional, right? They both kind of opt for that because they see that this, this sort of w way of love doesn't work for them. Um, she's not the traditional wife that he kind of yearns for. Um, and again, this is an, a, a, sort of something I've been witness to. A lot of our... Afghan westernized men, whether Afghan German and Afghan American, whatever, they want the mini skirt. They want you to look good. They want you to wear the makeup. They want you to have the hair. But at the end of the day, when it comes to their family, they want you to be the good bride and the, the virgin. You know, you have to, the virginity is extremely important to a lot of them, especially in my generation. It was, I think the younger generations changed, of course. And, and, and so, and then a lot of the girls find that they don't, the women who grew up in America, they're not finding the commitment and the family connection uh, among their own men in their community. Because what these men do is they go out all night to clubs, to nightclubs and discotheques and have fun and then come and expect their women to be virgins and do what they say. So there's this disconnect thinking they're from the same community, they get involved. What's better than this? We have a common goal. We've come back to the country. We're, we're going to rebuild our country together. Um, they have a cause. They have a common cause. And yet their identities are actually quite different. And there's a disconnect. So they both go back to the traditional. Yeah. You know, I was wondering, obviously, you've lived in the United States. And, um, and, and so again, would it be fair to say your background is one that 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 you know, has has dual perspectives. Does that what um, Fariba is saying resonate with you in terms of experiences or women you know? I think men are the same in every culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'll say about that. But yeah, I mean, I'm like I'm bicultural. I've lived, I've been educated in the United States, and even when I was living as a child in Pakistan, I went to an American school. And very interestingly, it was during the late '70s, early '80s the whole Cold War, the whole Afghan War, that whole thing was going on right in my backyard. And I've always wanted to actually write something about that time period, but it's still percolating in my mind. Um, what can I say? I mean, women, I think, are advancing more than men are in our part of the world. In Pakistan, I don't know if it's true of Afghanistan, but in Pakistan, for sure, women are really finding their feet, they're really stepping forward and the men are feeling left out and left behind. So they will also turn towards more traditional uh, setups and, and arranged marriages and they'll have their fun and they'll do what they like, but then they will expect the virgin bride as Fariba said. But Pakistani women, you know, their focus is on, it's independence and autonomy, but of a different story. It's not that sure everybody wants to experience what it's like to go to a club, wear the mini skirt, have a boyfriend and so on and so forth. But the Pakistani women who are in Pakistan and not really going abroad, but they're trying to find their, their empowerment and their, their liberation in Pakistan, they're very focused on careers. So they're very focused on education and they want love too. Uh, we're a very romantic nation, but I think the men they they can't they can't live up to what the women expect of them and there's so there's a lot of tension between the genders because of this. We we've, we've not got um, too much longer before the end and I know it's late for both of you. I I guess my final question um, and um, you can take it as read that I'm hugely grateful for for you joining us this evening. This book has brilliant writing, brilliant informed writing from around the world about 
astonishingly evil acts by a superpower, not the first to be evil, probably not the last. Um, details that people in those countries may have been aware of, not all of them, uh, but, but for most of us, there, there will be a significant amount in this book that we suspected but didn't know. How do you find hope um, knowing the extent to which a powerful country and powerful people can rape, torture, murder, oppress, bomb? Where, where does hope come for, for, for Pakistan, for Afghanistan, for women, for the world, when, when we know that um, powerful countries and organizations can do this? Um, I, I'm going to sound fatalistic when I say this, but I think we in Pakistan have accepted that this is the way of the world. We've known it from colonialism. We've known it through uh, American imperialism and the war on terror and so on and so forth. So we're, we're very aware of the fact that this is what larger, more powerful countries will do. I think we, we look for hope. Uh, we're looking to the East for, for our salvation from this paradigm. And I, I will say no more than that, but I think informed readers will know what I'm referring to. In the political, geopolitical sense, we're looking eastwards. Uh, we're also looking towards uh, nations like Turkey. And we, we want to build alliances, I think, with some of the regional powers to, to balance out what does seem like a very unfair and unipolar world. Uh, but we also then take a lot of, I think, uh, comfort from our religion, which teaches us that there may never be justice in this world. And really, the only place where you'll find perfect justice is in the next world. And I think a lot of people just cling to that it may be a psychological thing, it may be a crutch, and it is definitely, it's got its spiritual dimensions, but that the idea that if you're looking for justice in this world, you won't find it, and there's only one entity that can provide that justice. So I think most people are living by that, that uh, belief, and they go on with their lives. And I think hope is just in what you do. You create your family, you have your children, you put your best foot forward, you, you, there will always be you know, bigger powers, the government, taxes, crime, climate change, climate disaster, so on and so forth. There, there are forces bigger than us. So we stick together to our communities and to our families and to our people and to our drives as a means of finding some shelter in all these storms. Thank you. Fariba. Right now is hard for me to talk about hope. Um, I don't, you have no idea what it's been like for the last two months for my family, for my friends. I have lost so many colleagues, um, murdered, um, and the betrayal. It's, it's just really fresh. I think just, just so much anger right now. There's so much justified rage in our communities. Um, I just want to punch somebody. I mean, I'm being very raw with you guys here. Um, I don't, it's what Bina said, there's fatalism. Uh, but right now what I'm dealing with, at, at least in the homeland, uh, it's very hard to find the silver lining. I, I used to talk about a youth movement that was gonna stand up to the Taliban. But when you have every country from China to Pakistan to Iran, beating down on that youth movement and basically supporting the Taliban. What, what, how are they supposed to do anything? I keep getting videos of people getting shot um, by the Taliban. Um, and, and so this reality is, it's really hard. I find hope in my children. You know, I'm, um, I have two girls and it's, and I see them growing up and I see that I, I really need them I will, that's all I do is we talk a lot about this stuff. And so it's intergenerational trauma as well. Um, and I brought them from the US to Turkey because I wanted to raise them in, a, in an international city, close, as close as I could get to my homeland. That was still fair, you know, somewhat a normal life for them. And I don't regret it, although my family thinks it's, they don't like it. They're in California and they think that, you know, we should just shut the door on Afghanistan. 
it's ironic that I'm the youngest and I'm the closest to the homeland, I think. And um, I don't know. I, I, I look at my kids. She's sitting right here. She's 10. And it, she makes me smile. And that's what keeps me going. So, yeah. And my work. I work all the time. So it does something. It's made some individual difference. The fact that I got people out because I'm a journalist and I worked with them and that, that made, that gave me some hope. Yeah. In the end, I know that for the rest of us, the fact that, that Bina, Fariba, you and so many others bear witness and allow us to understand things we didn't. Um, we're hugely grateful. Um, and, um, and thank you both for these incredible stories and for joining us this evening. Bina Shah, Fariba Nawa, it's, uh, it's been such an honor to have you. Thank you for joining us at House Men's. Thank you for having us.